So now it is my great pleasure to introduce Judge Lilia Alvarez and Kirsten Eidenbach. Um, Judge Alvarez graduated from Air the University of Arizona with degrees in psychology and public health and received her JD from Phoenix School of Law. She's an attorney at law specializing in immigration issues and she's now a presiding judge in Guadalupe just a few miles south of here. I first met Judge Alvarez over a year ago when she took the time out of her busy schedule to talk with me and another student about the importance of a fair judicial system. She spoke of cultivating a bond of trust between legal institutions and community members. Her work in Guadalupe has led to a complete overhaul of the relationship between the courts and the people. Where there was once fear and mistrust, there is now mutual respect and cooperation. We spoke also of the role of restorative justice programs in the community. At this time, Judge Alvarez was just embarking on the process of establishing a teen court in Guadalupe. Now, a year and a half later, I'm so excited to hear about how the program has evolved. We are especially fortunate to be joined by some of the participants in the program today, sitting over there. We could not be happier to have you all here. I would also like to introduce um, Kirsten Eidenbach. Ms. Eidenbach um, is an attorney and the director of Eidenbach Law. Uh, there she focuses on prisoners' rights issues and civil rights cases. She also works in animal rights activism. She is here to continue the conversation about the importance of transitioning to a more restorative justice system, and specifically about the Arizona Transformative Law and Social Justice Center. Please welcome them both. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity, for the invitation to join you this Saturday and to learn so much. It's really been informative for me to sit here and listen to all the panelists. And thank you very much for the, the last 30 minutes of readings. It was very inspirational. So I'm going to move forward with what I hope will be a more, more of the inspirational part of what we can look forward to. I'm here humbly representing an absolutely outstanding group of youth. I, it is true that I am the presiding judge at Guadalupe Municipal Court, and I do hold hearings and trials with adults, but probably one of the most satisfying parts of my job is volunteering to mentor about 15 youth from Guadalupe who hear cases, juvenile cases, on a monthly basis. As Bridget was explaining to you, they are, you know, this dream started about a year and a half ago. That's when the discussions began. Next, please. Um, and today we have Guadalupe Teen Court. You can see them there, you know, sitting. Um, it, is a, it is a court setting. It is absolutely binding um, the decisions that these teens make on behalf of the defendants that appear before them. Just to give you a little bit of background, um, we have five of them here with us today, and I want to take the time to acknowledge them each individually because what I'm describing is, is what I participate in as a mentor, but really who hear these cases is them. Okay, we're talking about high school students who are 13 years old to 17 years old, deciding cases, that are assault cases, shoplift cases, curfew violation cases that their peers have been involved in. And they, they'll tell you a little bit more about restorative justice and what that means to them in just a moment. Next, please. So what is restorative justice? I wanna request that Danielle Delgado, who will, he's a, she's a teen core member, to come up here and tell you in her experience what she has learned as a team court member that is restorative justice. Hi everyone, my name is Danielle Delgado. I'm 14 years old and I'm a proud member of the Guadalupe Teen Court. Day one of walking into teen court, I did not know what restorative justice was. Now I am a strong advocate for this form of justice. Each member of Teen Court has a different definition of restorative justice, but restorative justice to me, restorative justice in a Teen Court setting is a way for kids, a way for teens who have committed, who have made a mistake, who have committed a criminal offense, to have a second chance. As a Teen Court, we have heard cases from kids who are in the fifth grade all the way to 18-year-olds. We are able to provide, through restorative justice, 
to these kids the ability to restore what happened to the victim, what happened to the community. And it, even if you go in a deeper meeting, what happened after they committed those crimes with their families, restore what happened with themselves. An amazing thing that teen court does using restorative justice provides um, is that the teen court in the Maricopa counties, all these teen courts in Maricopa County using restorative justice are able to stop juveniles from committing um, another crime. Actually, 98% of all kids and teens who go through teen court never commit another crime again. So we all make mistakes. Some mistakes can be worse than others. We all want forgiveness. We all want the sec a second chance. That's what restorative justice does. We give teens and kids second chances. Clearly, restorative justice is helpful and needs to be used specifically in youth, because all of the benefit, all the benefits that restorative justice does provide to the community and to everyone involved. In other words, restorative justice is wonderful and treat people the way you want to be treated. Thank you. Thank you. There you have it. You see, I get to witness these youth just continue to grow in their understanding of the justice system. I can tell you that. This is the definition that's adopted for restorative justice. Um, the restorative justice movement is grounded in values that promote both accountability and healing for all affected by crime. What makes Guadalupe Teen Court so special is that although other teen court models exist throughout the state, they are housed at different high schools. That means that it basically becomes a club where teens meet and they get to have these hearings mentored by teachers or sometimes probation officers who come over to the school and guide the process, the discussion process for these teens. Next, please. Well, what happens um, at Guadalupe is that all of these teens actually get to meet with me, a judge, a lawyer, and they get to learn about the law, learn about the justice system from someone who actually directly works within the system. Next, please. So we have a group of teens that meets not only on a monthly basis to hear cases, but they meet on a regular basis, a weekly basis with me every Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. after school. Now they are all volunteers. I don't really have any way to hold them accountable if they don't show up, right? But they hold each other accountable because they all understand that the work they do is so meaningful impactful truly to the lives of those that they hear. Next, please. So let me explain to you what it means to decide real cases. The teens here with us today and also in the picture, they are all participating in a formal setting where a teen, 13 to 17 years old, Danielle, who you just heard speak, she has been the judge in these cases, for example. The teens play roles, they play the, the judge, they play the lawyer, they play the victim's advocate, they play the jurors. And I say play because they haven't gone to school to, you know, to be licensed as a lawyer, but they understand the parameters, they train for these roles, and they actually carry out the duties. Now, what this means is that after they hear the cases, they get to and what I, when I say hear the cases, the defendant, sometimes as young as nine years old, have appeared before them, they take a seat, the bailiff escorts them, escorts their family in, and these teens have been trained to ask very careful questions, meaningful questions about what is going on in the life of this young person that has made them take the steps they have taken, right? That has made them maybe... Uh, choose the wrong, the, the wrong decision. And you will be surprised, or maybe not, the answers that these youth give have to do with deeper issues, right? Maybe feeling out of touch with their family, or feeling that they don't have goals, that they don't have a perspective of the future. Well, these teens who participate in teen court are able to facilitate consequences. Next, please. Asking questions about truth or consequence. I don't know how, New Mexico. On my way to New Mexico, I took that picture. 
And I thought, whoa, this is exactly what I want to put on the screen about teen court. Because this is exactly what happens in teen court. They have to say, well, tell us the truth. And they interact with their peers. I'm truly just facilitating it, sort of a, a fly on the wall, you know, observing that everything's being taken care of in a, in a way that upholds the decorum of justice. But then they decide what are the consequences that would positively impact this youth's life? What are the consequences that would encourage this young person to not get back into the system? Very important. Next, please. Now, here's a poster that one of our own, she's here with us, Gloria Jimenez, designed. And I really like this poster because it was part of an exercise uh, where they went to a, we, I drove a 15 passenger van all the way to NAU in order for them to go to the Teen Court Summit. And there we are, they're working on their poster. And I asked them, what does this mean to you? And I want you to pay attention to Lady Justice at the top corner. Most people don't understand this about the justice system, but it is crucial to us remaining in integrity about what justice is all about. Now, as judge, as a judge, I have to go to mandatory conferences, go through judicial training. And we talk at length about Lady Justice being blindfolded. And what that means is making sure we understand that we're judging a person based on the law and the facts. But implicit bias plays such a key role, and I'm going to talk to you about that in, a, in just a moment. Is that the next one? Thank you. So as part of the teens hearing cases, they go through training with me on a weekly basis to understand their own biases. Because to rule on cases, even you know, I mean, them being so young, they have to understand that, and, they, and we have conversations at length about this, what does it mean for them to be unbiased and really listen to that young person in front of them, listen to the facts, listen to the victim's advocate, compare, it's the scales of justice, right? On one hand, we have the mitigating factors, and on the other hand, the aggravating factors. Can you raise your hand if you understand those terms? Okay, most of you do. But it's basically a delicate balance. Now these are teens judging their peers. And when they do so, I can humbly say, I think they do a better job sometimes than most adult judges. Because for whatever reason, we've been alive longer and there's more implicit bias to check at the door but they have done a fabulous job really understanding what restorative justice means and to be able to check those implicit biases at the door or at least be aware of them so they can set them aside and rule accordingly. Next, please. So there you have it. Here's another beautiful shot of them. They truly love what they do. They are passionate about it. And I, I've learned so much from them. Specifically, I have learned that experiential Learning is the key to success, is the key to disrupting recidivism. That's because most of them, they know someone in their classroom, they know a friend, a relative, who has become part of the system. A lot of times, actually, they'll say, oh, so-and-so who we heard here, right, in class later, they meet them. It's such a small world. But I really appreciate how not only does it impact them positively in their personal lives, but then they become examples. They are truly the leaders of the future. Next, please. So in order for them to truly embody justice, not only do they hear cases, but they are learning, right? There's three branches of government. They know that they are part of the judicial branch of government, but they've also interacted with legislators. Here they are with um, Supervisor Gallardo, who represents Guadalupe, and we take field trips so that they understand the big picture too. It's not just about the judiciary, but it is the legislative branch of government, the executive. Next, please. In order to have a say, many of our seniors have also registered to vote. It is important not just to know the theory, but to be in it, grassroots, understanding it from the ground up. Next, please. So. 
they've also been able to meet other teens. And you see, I, I wanted you to pay attention to the, the sign there, a community of hope. That is the slogan of teen courts across Arizona. This was the largest teen court summit so far at NAU. And it was hundreds of teen court members across the state. We just happen to be the only ones that are at a municipal court. And, and we, we got cheered and everything because we were, we were there. And I was the only judge there also. So it was, it was a big deal because most judges also, we don't get trained on how to appreciate this kind of uh, experience in restorative justice. Next, please. So part of it, along the same lines, is setting personal goals. What, what we've learned is that in order to disrupt recidivism, not only do we need to take on the leadership roles, the hands-on approach, but it's about unlocking dreams. And I know Ms. Eisenbach is going to talk about this more, about her program, but it's, it's at every level. Legally, we know there's a line. Talk about that, that dark line right here. There's a divide. There's, if you are under 18, then you're a young person, you're a juvenile. If you are all, over 18, then you're an adult. And there's totally different law that applies. But I will tell you that when I first had the conversation about launching teen court in Guadalupe, there was a crucial moment where there were all the stakeholders around the table from superior court, from law enforcement there in Guadalupe, from uh, Guadalupe Municipal Court. And when I said, I don't want to sentence young people like, I, I could. I could be a juvenile hearing officer and sentence kids to jail or to large fines. But I said, the best approach is to have teens, to teach teens to go through teen court and be able to deliver restorative justice this way. It caused a little bit of a, of a, a disruption because law enforcement said to me, if they're guilty, they're guilty. So I had to explain there's a difference between a 13-year-old and a 35-year-old. But I tell you, we have to begin the conversation even at that level. Next, please. So lo and behold, I'm here, again, standing before you as a community leader, but very humbly so because, as others have expressed in the panel, I have learned so much from the teens who truly are courageous at taking risks. Most of them are shy, and they still speak up when they are in their roles at the hearings. They make the time, the commitment to show up every week. It's a Saturday, and I could get five of them to show up. You know, I'm impressed by that, too. They really are a dynamic group of teens, and they are not the exception. This is what I want to leave you with. People will say, there was a comment uh, in the audience about you can, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make him drink. And I know that I grew up with those types of sayings, but being with teen court has really taught me that that's not completely accurate and that we need to rephrase how we think about these issues, reframe it. And it's been my experience and also the town council in Guadalupe and in all the leadership there, they'll say, oh my gosh, we never knew our teens would be so committed. Because I go and recruit them from the feeder schools because there isn't a high school in Guadalupe. But just by providing someone the opportunity, I have found you don't have to force anyone to drink anything. They're just waiting for the opportunity and then they do the rest. So I have bear witness to their development, their growth, and I just hope that they continue with it because a lot of good has come of it and only, it's only the beginning. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kirsten Eidenbach. Um, and in my introduction, you heard that I um, am a pretty involved person. Um, I do own my own law firm, I do prisoners' rights work, and uh, throughout the course of uh, my career doing that, I have worked with hundreds and hundreds of prisoners. What I began to see was when they were released, they had no resources available to them. 
they faced obstacles that were almost insurmountable. Um, and so I began to do thinking on my own about, you know, what can I do? Can I start uh, putting together a database, helping um, create some of these resources and populate the field of reentry resources? Um, but pretty early on when I started talking to um, the population I call prison survivors, I realized I'm not the right person to design reentry resources. The people who have experienced prison who've come out and who've not had access to those resources, those are the people who should be putting together these programs. Um, and that is when Atlas Justice Center was born. Um, I'm here today as a representative of Atlas Justice Center. Um, my co-founder and the other executive director, Jonathan Trethaway, who himself is a prison survivor, um, is here also today. So the purpose of Atlas is to really transform the entire landscape of reentry resources. And by that, I mean an, a true paradigm shift. And so what we're focusing on is unlocking the dreams of those touched by the criminal justice system, um, in particular prison survivors themselves. But first, we need to start with the reality, because we have a tremendous population of individuals directly and indirectly touched by the prison system in Arizona. We currently have just under 43,000 people incarcerated. That's the sixth largest prison population in the country. Arizona incarcerates people at a rate of 589 per 1,000 residents, which is the highest rate of incarceration of any Western state. Um, there was talk a little bit this morning about um, what our recidivism rate is. I have to be frank, I had a hard time finding the statistic. <laughs> I see some nods. Um, and the statistic I did find comes from prosecutors. So not an entirely unbiased statistic. Um, I've heard anecdotal estimates as high as 85%. Um, but this seemed to be the... the um, one that was supported by data, um, really the only one I could find. Um, it's probably a little bit low, but it, as you can see, it's much higher than the one that we were um, quoted this morning. Now, where my work intersects with Judge Alvarez's is here, right? Children who have an incarcerated parent are five to seven more times more likely to go to prison as adults. And what this tells us is that restorative justice does not end with the children. It needs to extend to the entire population who are touched by the criminal justice system. So how do we do this? Right, this is a really daunting task. As someone who's thought about this a lot, I can assure you um, that it's a really complicated issue. What we've done at Atlas is we've begun to distill it down into some key areas that we don't think are very well addressed. Um, you've heard a lot today about employment and housing. Those are obviously absolutely imperative. Um, but these are less tangible, less talked about issues that every single person coming out of prison faces. Um, we need to start erasing the institutional institutionalization that has been pounded into them every day of their incarceration. And how do we do that? We teach them to dream, right? I mean, it sounds a little bit loosey-goosey, but really that's what we're talking about. We need to help them remember that they have dignity as human beings and individuals and help them restore their sense of self-worth. We need to educate the community, and this has come up multiple times today. We need to dismantle the stereotypes that are pervasive throughout our culture, our society, and in particular, our media. And we need to rebuild the family structure, because study after study has shown that those individuals, those prison survivors who are successful uh, at reintegration are those who are supported by strong family structures. This is what drives us at Atlas. I have met tremendous individuals inside the walls of prison. 
They have opened my mind. They have opened my heart. And I have seen intelligence and passion like none other. We want to harness that. We want to harness that to completely redefine re-entry in Arizona. We're going to start here. We don't plan to stop here. Um, but we want to empower this marginalized population to, to make their voices heard, just like Donna was talking about this morning, um, to amplify those voices and let them define what kind of resources they actually need coming out of prison. So we have developed um, a personal growth curriculum. I'm going to skip ahead because I know we're a little bit short on time. Um, that really speaks to the mental strength and mental fortitude that individuals must possess, must cultivate, must get in touch with in order to successfully reintegrate into society. And nobody talks about this, right? We want to find them a job right away. We want to find them housing right away. And those are great things, and they're necessary things. But what, what doesn't get talked about as often is the fact that for every job they finally get, they've gotten 150, 200 rejections. Right? You have to have incredible fortitude and support to make it through that kind of judgment and rejection and not lose hope, and not give up on your dreams, and not settle for less than what you're worth. We want to teach them to um, find happiness and gratitude. Uh, we want to help them conquer their shame. There's tremendous shame associated with having a criminal record. Um, but as uh, one of my favorite scholars, Shaka Senghor, has said, you are not defined by your worst deed. You made a mistake. Here you are. Let's figure out what you want to do with the rest of your life and move forward. We want to help them identify their strengths. Um, do this, uh, we plan to do this through some personality tests. But also, more importantly, and this has been mentioned, I can't remember in which uh, presentation, teaching them to map their lives. Right? We start with daily to-do lists. And then we move to short-term goals. Then we move to long-term goals. And then we move to teaching them how to map out their ultimate career goal. And there is no prescribed method of mapping, which is probably the most important part of our curriculum. Because the key to successful mapping is making sure that that mapping works the way that your brain works, right? Just between myself and Jonathan, we do lists completely differently, right? I'm very visual. I like things drawn. I like them going in every direction. I mean, if you look at my notes, I have stuff all over the place. I have arrows. He is very linear. So his lists would be, you know, right down the page, bulleted, um, numbered. And I know this sounds a little bit simplistic, but really learning how your brain works, how you self-motivate, how you can actually follow through with an accomplishment, that is a tremendous skill. It's very practical, it's very pragmatic. I am a pragmatist, um, but it's very important. And so woven throughout our curriculum is this idea of mapping your way forward and obviously helping them uh, seek support, ask for help, um, and unlocking and pursuing their dreams. First and foremost, um, I think the paradigm shift in the reentry arena has to start humanizing these folks. They are not scary. They are not bad people. They don't all look the same. It doesn't even matter what their crime is. They're back in society. They're human beings, first and foremost. Um, and that is the message that has got to start getting out in order for um, the stereotypes that pervade our culture to begin to be dismantled and for us to be able to change the paradigm. Now I'm getting back into the overlap between our work, which I have to say, it has been an absolute pleasure um, to explore and cultivate the overlap between teen court um, and disrupting recidivism and improving reentry. Because this 
is what is important. This is the commonality between every single person I've talked to. All of them have lost someone. All of them have a child, a brother, a mother, a father on the outside who sits deep in their heart and keeps them going. This is the structure we need to put back together because this is the structure that gets ripped apart when we incarcerate, incarcerate, incarcerate. When we start putting individuals, prison survivors, back into their families in such a way that they can succeed, they begin to be positive role models for their kids, which hopefully translates into fewer teen defendants in teen court. Um, and it sends the message to those kids, you make a mistake, yes, there are going to be consequences, but you move forward. It does not define the rest of your life. There is a pathway to success. There is a pathway to healing. So that is the work that Atlas Justice Center um, is setting out to do. We are very early on in the process. Um, but we have been approved to uh, start teaching our personal growth curriculum in the federal prison in Tucson. Um, we're going to be teaching it in the federal work release um, prison, uh, the federal work release program in Tucson. Um, we've been talking with parole and probation up in Phoenix. So hopefully we're going to begin inch by inch, person by person, to start changing the topography of reentry in Arizona start putting families back together, start healing individuals, um, and really start changing the paradigm of what re-entry is about. So now we have a joint slide, because what we wanted to do is, we're both pragmatists, I think, we, want, we wanted to give everybody tangible ideas and tangible ways um, that we can begin to disrupt recidivism going forward, uh, because a lot of what I've talked about is not very tangible, um, but there are concrete steps that we can all take together that really will um, begin to impact and begin to reduce recidivism. Here is this. I think you're live. Thank you. I believe that our team effort here this afternoon I think we've both done our part in showing just that a person's life, right, doesn't end at 17. It continues on to be 18, 19, 20, and beyond. And that, I mean, I can recall being 13 years old. And actually, I have my, my judicial mentor who I care and appreciate so deeply. She says to me, but for the grace of God, I would not be here. And it's true. I feel that way, very much so. Um, and so I fully acknowledge that if it wasn't for things in place to keep my family un united and, um, and keep me in after-school programs and making sure that I had a pathway, I would not be here. I, I would have been a completely different walk. But in my experiential... Uh, Excuse me, in, in my experience, I find that experiential education is key. It has to be curriculum that, as others have pointed out, really makes sense to the individual going through, um, through the process. Now, the teen court members are experts at this. When they listen to the defendant, they ask questions like, do you have a role model? And you'll be surprised at the answers that the, that the young person has. Do you, do you have goals? Are there after school programs that you can go to? Because they're operating thinking about the consequences from a list of resources that they can then assist that person, that, in, that young person, again, nine years old to 17 years old, getting them plugged in into an, a field of, of being encouraged. And so they are really experts at this, tapping into what is this person's needs, what are the experiences they need in order to unlock dreams. 
because some of the consequences are things like a membership to the YMCA. So some of the consequences they give to, to teens for a curfew violation, for example, which in Guadalupe, a curfew violation is a class two misdemeanor. Then there's, there's ways to address the issue, the underlying issue. And of course, they do so, they only are able to do so because they have addressed their implicit bias. They care so deeply about being fair, about doing justice, that they address that and they don't perceive that other, you know, 12 year old, 13 year old in front of them as less than them. And that's what I'm telling you that it's really a humbling experience for me to experience them so ready to, to do the right thing where we as adults sometimes need a little bit more help. I think I talked through the recipe um, that Atlas is going to be following. Um, but I think that really one of the key takeaways is that we have a really large prison population, which means we have a lot of people entering back into the community, and there are not enough resources for those folks. That is the reality. In fact, not one person I've talked to since their release has received adequate help in reentry. Um, many of them have suffered catastrophic consequences as a result of that. But that is the void that we're hoping to help fill. And I, we are not alone in this field. Um, there are a lot of people who are working diligently, um, both within the Arizona Department of Corrections, within the community, there are other nonprofits, within the educational community. I think that there's a growing awareness that this is a problem that we must solve. But the reality is that at the moment, we don't have the resources. Um, and that's really what prompted Jonathan and I to start Atlas. Um, and we made a commitment to make sure that Atlas itself would give back to that community by creating opportunities for um, prison survivors who are re-entering to participate in Atlas, to help them start their own businesses, to help them um, successfully reunite with their families, um, and become ultimately productive members of society. Because what I have realized is that when we warehouse these folks and we basically throw them away, we are losing such incredible gifts. And I think that we just witnessed one of the most perfect examples of that that we possibly could have picked. We don't want to lose those gifts. We don't want to lose these people. And in order to not do that, we have to provide a path for them to successfully reintegrate into society and not be forced to turn back to the only economy open to them, which is the economy of crime. So um, I know that we're way over time. Um, we're very open to questions. Jonathan also um, is very open to questions. Um, I don't know if you guys want to shut it down and have us take questions offline or... Okay. Are there any questions? I know. Thank you all so much. That's why it's hard to be the last speaker of the day. Yes. Program in the federal prison in Arizona? Uh, yes. Is there a reason why you're choosing the federal prison and not the state prison that you can share with us? I'm sure there's no. <laughs> uh, there's a, um, vaguely put, uh, primarily because of my, my work as an attorney. Um, that's a system that uh, it's a little bit easier for me to interface with right now. Was there a question? Oh, yes. Have there been any, uh, any other states that have been interested in this? Um, well, it's, it's brand new. I mean, like a couple months old. Um, but I will tell you that there are states that have um, programs with similar philosophies. California, of course, is like way out ahead of the pack. They have computer coding programs in prisons. Um, they, I mean, they just, they have venture capitalists who go in and teach entrepreneurship in prison. So they really are um, implementing a lot of programs that have led to very successful re-entry. Um, but 
this specifically is about two months old. Um, and so we're starting with the federal uh, system in Arizona. Hopefully we'll begin working with the state system um, and then we'll take it from there and see how it goes. Yes? Uh, that is a hard question. There are. The problem with the programs in Arizona is that nobody knows about each other. So as an attorney who works with prisoners in a legal context, I wanted, and you know, my clients are getting out of prison, I wanted to be able to refer them to the resources, to the nonprofits or um, state-run programs. And for the most part, in the beginning, nobody knew anything. They might have one um, recommendation, but organically over the course of the past year, I've discovered that there really are a fair number of people working in this group. It's just that nobody knows each other. And so that's what we're working on remedying right now, is putting together a more comprehensive list of what actually does exist here in Arizona. Um, because we do have a fair number of resources. They're just, a lot of them are very narrowly focused on individual issues, um, and they don't, they don't really have a need to branch out. So that is one of the things that we're currently working on, putting together. Any other questions? Well, thank you all so much for hanging in with us until like the very, very last minute of the day. I really appreciate your attention um, and your thoughtful questions.